Okay, so one of the things you said was, or, or I, I think you were kind of proposing, I remember, that it might be another hallmark of aging. Like the, yes, the, the, I these, think it is. <laughs> you, so, so, but then it would need to be somewhat predictable, right? At, at least in- Well, it, if you look at what the criteria for, are for a hallmark, so it, it needs to be something that happens during normal aging. Mm-hmm. It needs to be something that if you aggravate it experimentally, you will accelerate aging. And it needs to be something that if you ameliorate it experimentally, it will improve um, aging or senescence outcomes. So if we take those sequentially, number one, does it happen in normal aging? So the answer to that is yes. So the whole reason we found this is because we, we went looking this is way before all of the, the stuff we're doing now. This was back in about 2009. We asked the question, what changes as we age? So we went in and we looked at the whole transcriptome and we asked the question, what changes as we age? Um, we did this in 700 people in, in blood and we measured every transcript in all 700 people. And then we classified those transcripts according to what they did. So the first thing we found was that actually we were quite surprised that not much looks like it changes on the individual transcript level. About 3% of genes show really massive changes, but they are dependent on what tissue you're measuring in. And they're largely effect rather than cause. Um, But when we classify, so we divide those transcripts that are different into what they do. We found that there were seven classes of job and six of those were splicing. So we let, the, we let the, an unbiased view ask what changes and what changes, and we've shown this in two or three populations, it's the things that regulate the expression of your genes and specifically the things that regulate either how stable they are, what forms you make um, and, and, what, and where they're expressed, that's what changes. So yes, this happens in normal human populations and this was a cross-sectional population study. We've also subsequently shown that you can measure levels of splicing factors or, you know, you can look at splicing regulation at baseline and follow what happens. So we have a pop, we, we, we work with the Inchianti study of aging quite a lot. Um, and that it's a longitudinal study. So we can measure what happens at baseline and look what happens 12 years later. And what we found was that the people who had lower levels of splicing factors, um, the people that had the lowest levels had greater change in cognitive function. They dropped more in cognitive function and some features of frailty also. We've also shown some of them are associated with longevity in people, with some of them associated with longevity in mice. In fact, the only place where we have not ever seen an association with um, aging and senescence phenotypes is naked mole rats. And we don't see anything in naked mole rats. It's flat as a pancake and we look really hard, but naked mole rats don't senesce in the same way that other animals do. And also they live 35 years compared with three years for a similarly sized rodent. So we've shown that these things are, these things are different in normal aging in multiple species. So I think we can tick off number one. Number two is that when we experimentally aggravate it, we should be able to um, accelerate features of aging. So the data for that come from um, about 2017, and we did a study where we were looking at all sorts of various molecules and what they did to splicing factors. Um, And we were looking at hydrogen sulfides actually, which have a a similar um, rejuvenative effect as we've seen with some of the other small molecules. And during the course of those studies, we took a couple of splicing factors in in, um, normal, primary human cells, young cells, and we knock them out and those cells age. Um, And then also what we showed was that that some of the treatments that we were using to bring about sort of rejuvenative changes in those cells, if you knock those genes down, they no longer respond. So that's, it's not, it's not as comprehensive a data set for that point as I would like, but actually, if you look at the original Hallmarks paper, they do concede that some of these things are actually really difficult to address. And actually not all of the Hallmarks have all of those three ticked. Tick. But I think we have evidence to say that if we, if we mess with them, we can bring about accelerated senescence. So I think we tick that. And the third one is if we um, experimentally um, restore them to where they should be, you should get, um, you should get, uh, Change, oh, actually, before I forget, the other thing um, in terms of the aggravation and accelerated aging is that there are, are knockout models, knockout mice for some of our splicing factors which have accelerated aging phenotypes. So that's the other thing. So I think we've got two ticks there. Um, and then the third tick, 
I think that if we if we if we restore it to where it should be, you should improve aspects of aging and senescence. So aging is a difficult one, but senescence not so much. So what we find is that you know we've used small molecules, two two or three different kinds of small molecules now, plus some targeted genetics to show that when we restore splicing factors back to where they should be, we can reverse various aspects of senescence. So I think we've got those three ticks. And I'm quite happy to say that we've got evidence that we should at least be considering this as, as another hallmark of ageing. We've got at least as much evidence for this as some of the other hallmarks have. Okay. Uh, yeah, well, a couple of questions in there. So one is, um, how are these splicing factors related to senescence, particularly to, to cell senescence? Okay. <laughs> so this is, this is, this is really, um, there are a lot of reasons, a simple answer. So splicing factors don't just do splicing. So there are a bunch of different explanations. So number one, senescence is primarily a response to a cellular stressor. So cells become senescent because they've been stressed either by you know, a whole bunch of stuff. Now, if you have a situation where your cell is unable to respond to external stress by changing what it's making, that is going to be a provocation for senescence. If you've got a situation where the cell can't make what it needs to make in normal homeostasis, let alone in cellular stress, that is going to be a provocation for senescence. Splicing factors are also, uh, as I say, they're, they're known as the Swiss army knife of, of genes because they do so many things other than splicing. So they do splicing, but they're also very entwined in maintenance and regulation of RNA stability. So they, um, they regulate a lot of the stability of a lot of the RNAs for the SASP which obviously is, a, is a, a driver for paracrine senescence. They also have roles in um, stabilization, some of them, of, of, um, of some of the other, other transcripts, so globally, transcript home-wide. They also have roles in telomere maintenance. So some of the telomeres are basically RNA and RNA-mediated thing, aren't they? So um, they, um, some of them can switch on telomerase. Some of them can unwind chromatin around the TERP genes so that they can switch the telomerase gene back on. Um, they also have roles in a process called RNA surveillance. RNA surveillance is a process by which the cell, it's quality control, um, by which the cells can identify aberrant transcripts and get rid of them. So, and that is dependent on splicing. If you don't have correct splicing, you don't get you don't get transcriptomic quality control. So you've got multiple ways that these genes are actually prodding that cell towards senescence, which is why I think they, that's, that's why I think they're causal for it. Do you think that the, the splicing factors are like the thing that decides whether a cell becomes senescent or apoptosis? Or I think they do have a direct role in that. I don't think they are the only thing that decides that. Of course not. Right. But I think that, you know, they're part of the battery of, of cellular decision making when a cell's sitting there wondering, you know, have I got so much damage that actually I'm going to cause a problem for the cell in the case of cancer? Or, um, you know, can I just not cope with all of this, this, these outside things that are happening? And, and I'm just, you know, I'm just going to become senescent. I think they're part of that decision making. So if we wanted to... Uh keep these senescent, these, uh, sorry, these splicing factors kind of in best health. Is there any specific like behavior that we know about that would work for that? <laughs> so, so generally anything that keeps the rest of you in good health is going to be good for that. So what you want to, so, so the thing that's causing them to degrade over time or to, to, to get switched off actually over time is this repeated signaling from the outside of the cell and that signaling can be things like reactive oxygen it can be nutrients you know so, so anything where anything where you're going to be prodding those cellular signaling pathways into constant activity is not going to be good for long-term maintenance of splicing factors so i think the the simple um answer to that is you know keeping the rest of you healthy and minimizing the the the, the kind of person-wide exposure to things that are bad for cells for all sorts of reasons is it, it's a holistic thing mm -hmm. so 